My name is Bill Groner, Cayuga Hall, 1973, 74, 75. College in the Woods, class of 1977. And the one thing I'm feeling today is I am back home. On behalf of the Alumni Association Board of Directors, I'm a proud member of an amazing organization. We welcome you to Tear Talks, Homecoming 2015. <laughs> the concept behind Tear Talks was we wanted to leverage the brilliance and the intellect of the faculty and the alumni. We have over 100,000 alumni out there. And we want to show the world and our own community how great we truly are. Because of last year's event, the feedback was amazing. We are now expanding tier talks. We have a committee of over 15 people working on developing other formats. One of the formats will be tier travel, which means we're coming to a city near you. One company, M&T Bank, shares our vision and is our sponsor. And I'd like to introduce Peter Newman, alumnus and regional president of M&T Bank. Thank you, Bill. I'd like to thank the Alumni Association for giving us this opportunity. I'm also a proud alumnus. Uh, I earned my master's in business administration here. Uh, the School of Management is near and dear to my heart, and the university is near and dear to my heart. I live in this community, and I feel very strongly that we need to share the brilliance of the alumni and the faculty with the community. And that's really the reason that M&T Bank is sponsoring the first of the next three years of Tear Talks. Um, I love the idea of expanding the, the awareness within this community of what we have here on campus in an, in an academic setting because I, everyone in the community knows what a wonderful asset this is to the community. I'm not sure we're sharing the academic brilliance the way we need to, particularly as I see it with the business community since that's where I'm living day in and day out. And then taking it to a, a, a city near you, that's terrific too. So Bill, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for creating this program to the Alumni Association and enjoy today. Okay, let's get to the program. I have the honor and privilege of introducing our moderator, Dr. Gloria Meredith. Dr. Meredith, uh, her bio is literally a who's who in the world of science. Uh, degrees, bachelor's and master's in biology, PhD in neuroscience, 160 published articles, uh, decades in research in biomedical, clinical education. And after a national search, uh, we found her as the founding dean of our uh, School of Pharmacy. Without further ado, Dr. Gloria Meredith. Thank you very much for that introduction. Good afternoon. I'm really pleased to see you here today because you're about to enter a very mysterious, fascinating world of neuroscience. And I am particularly honored because I get the opportunity to introduce you to four brilliant neuroscientists who are going to lead you through the latest brain breakthroughs in this field. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Christopher Bishop. He is professor and chair of psychology here at Binghamton University. And Dr. Bishop is an expert in those um, terrible brain diseases that accompany aging. He is um, going to talk to you about how to maybe avoid some of the decline in aging and going to give you some hints on how to protect and um, strengthen your brain as you get older so, um, so that as you grow older, you can continue to grow wiser. Dr. Bishop.
Fantastic, what an opportunity. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this chance. So I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. And I want to start out with the good news. We like our good news first. We're living longer. A lot longer, actually. People born in this decade will live almost 10 years longer than those of my vintage. I'm a 1972, in case you wonder. Not only that, but the population of those over the age of 60 is likely to double in the next three decades. Wow. People are definitely living longer. But there's some bad news. The bad news is with longevity comes some risk. Risk that might be physical, risk that might be cognitive. Physical risks like frailty, arthritis, lack of mobility, Cognitive risk, changes in memory, our ability to execute and plan. And these things can even progress to a clinical state or brain disease. Right now in the United States, over 6 million individuals have been diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease, something like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. The nexus of this longevity and disease comes when we look at the aging population. Of those 85, 30% will be diagnosable for one of these brain diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or both. Kind of scary. The problem is, I feel like I failed you, okay? Because as a scientist, I have not yet been able to identify the cause of these diseases. We've known about these diseases for over a century, and yet we know it's not genes. I know a lot of people think that, oh, I've got an uncle, I've got a brother, somebody with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, I'm going to get it. You aren't. It's not genetic, by and large. It's not toxins. Okay, they contribute a little bit, maybe increase the risk factor, but it's not any So. Without knowing what causes these diseases, we can't predict it. And by the time you go see a physician and say, you know what, I've got a tremor, I don't know where it came from, or my memory just isn't what it used to be, you may have lost over 50% of the neurons, these brain cells that are responsible for these functions. Current treatments, they don't change the trajectory of the disease. They just help with the symptoms. They're palliative. That's unfortunate. So we need to make a shift from treatment to prevention. And today what I'd like to argue is we need a strategy that can help us with this. And that strategy, I believe, is something called neuroprotection, protecting your brain. Now, if we take a step back for a moment and we think about what this strategy would look like for us, personally, I would hope that it would be accessible to everybody. My hope is that it would be inexpensive, that it would be global, and by global, I don't mean global economy, global warming. What I mean is global for our brains, that this strategy would protect all facets of our brain. And then finally, and this might be a pipe dream, but I hope that it could be neurorestorative. Neurorestorative meaning that I could stop the progression of the disease or even reverse the ravages of the aging or the disease. Okay, what would meet this lofty criteria? What possibly could? Well, to do that, we need to turn to two seemingly disparate or different areas within the field of neuroscience. One, development. Amazing topic. Do you know the things that happen during neural development? We go from one brain cell to 100 billion, that's a B, brain cells in nine months. There are times during neural development where we create upwards of 250,000 brain cells in one minute. So what the heck is the stimulus that is leading this to happen? That seems like a clue to me. But let's put a bookmark in that and move to the other field, learning and memory. It wasn't that long ago when we thought, once you mature, the brain doesn't change much. 
And in fact, if anything, it just starts falling apart. Okay, cool thing. In the last couple decades, scientists have shown that people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s can continue to make new brain cells throughout their life. Now, what causes this to happen? Well, it turns out that as we interact with our environment, we need new neural pathways. This is how we learn, and this is how we create memories. We need these new brain cells. What's the stimulus that is leading us to create new brain cells throughout our life? And it turns out, from this field and from this field, there's one thing that's common, and it's neurotrophins. Neurotrophins. Let's take a look at the word for a second. Neuro of the brain, central nervous system. Trophins, grower, nourisher. These are molecules that we find within our brains. We all have them, or you wouldn't be here. I'm telling you right now, okay? We all have these things, and these are incredibly important for helping neurons to be born, for helping them to survive, and helping them to integrate. That means creating new neural networks. What an amazing stimulus these things are. And I have a video here that I would like to show you if I could. Let's see if I can make the magic happen. Here we go. What you're looking at here are stem cells. These are young cells that haven't decided what they're gonna be yet, okay? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna add one of these neurotrophins to these cells, and I want you to watch what Check it out. They move, they grow, and they send out processes, and they start talking to each other. And in fact, they begin to make the beginnings of a neural network. What's the stimulus? Neurotrophins. So how can I get me some neurotrophins? <laughs> Great question. You can't take a neurotrophin pill. And there aren't great drugs for neurotrophins. And in fact, if neurotrophins are delivered to the wrong cells, you can get the proliferation, the growth of the wrong kind of cell. And we all know what that is, right? Cancer. So we've got to have a strategy that augments or increases neurotrophins from within. From within. We need some strategy that does that. This takes us to the next place in our investigation. A place, a strange place, far away. A place even colder than Binghamton, New York. <laughs> it can't happen. Minnesota, yes, that's right, Minnesota. In the 1980s, there was a researcher, David Snowden, who was looking to understand why it was that some people got Alzheimer's disease and some people didn't. In Minnesota, there was a convent of sisters who were concerned because they watched as their fellow nuns came down with Alzheimer's disease and eventually died. Coincidence would have it that they came together. And the women said, Dr. Snowden, we have data for you. Over a thousand people's worth of data. We've got writing samples from when our women started in the convent. We have their lifestyle through the decades. We know when they died. We know what they died from. Would you be interested in looking at, and he said, don't, you don't need to say anything more. I'm loving this. And he got one more thing that made his work groundbreaking. He was able to get them to consent to giving their brains. So he had this rich data set from which to work. And he was able to look at those that got Alzheimer's and those that didn't. Looked at what predicted it. And what he found was women who engaged in complex cognitive activities were protected from Alzheimer's disease. Now, he had the brains looking to confirm that the brains would actually look different from one another. And here's the crazy part. When he looked, the asymptomatic and the symptomatic brains actually looked about the same. The women who were protected actually had Alzheimer's pathology, some of them, and yet remain untouched by the disease. They had created more complex neural networks. The compensation and neuroplasticity that came from what we now know based on basic science is neurotrophins 
allowed them to stave off the expression of the disease. And that's amazing. So my first main point is, what strategy could we use? Cognitive exercise. Exercise your brains. Engage in complex activities. Read new things. Continue your education. Maybe even eventually, sometimes play complex video games. I'm cool with that. All right, there's some evidence that stuff can work too. Learn a new instrument. Try something different. Okay, these things work. But there's one more strategy that I would like to leave you with that perhaps is even more powerful than cognitive exercise. Right now, roughly 400 yards from here, in one of the science buildings, I have rats. Those rats love to run. They will run 10 kilometers a day if given the opportunity. What do they know that we don't know? And it turns out physical exercise is one of the most potent stimulators of neurotrophins that we know. Physical exercise, that good old physical exercise. Basic neuroscience has shown this over and over again. And there's very strong evidence that physical exercise is fantastic at delaying brain disease or even slowing brain disease. Now the work in humans is just starting. Believe it or not, this work is very new. One of my favorite studies comes from Pittsburgh where they had a group of individuals in their 60s and they said, okay, we're gonna make your groups roughly equal. Okay, we're gonna split you into three. Group number one, you're going to be sedentary for a year. Aww. All right, group two, stretching. Oh, that sounds lovely. Okay, and group three was gonna get moderate exercise. Oh, exercise, really? It's not that bad, okay? They followed them through a year and they had different variables they used to determine what the effects of their conditions were. What they found was this. One group was somewhat different. Not surprisingly, the physical exercise group was more physically fit but they were also far better at cognitive tasks. They put these people into scanners, and the areas of the brain responsible for learning and memory were larger. And that correlated with one biological assay in particular, one biological sample, neurotrophins. Neurotrophins. So it seems to me that our strategy of neuroprotection, whether it be cognitive exercise or physical exercise, could be accessible. That it could be inexpensive. Buy that swimsuit and goggles, get out there and swim. Global, especially physical exercise, amazing for the brain. Neurorestorative, that remains to be seen, okay? But one of my colleagues, Dr. Lisa Savage, right now is testing the effects of exercise in a neurologic disease, and she's finding amazing functional recovery with physical exercise, and that could work for us too. But I have one final caveat for you today, and the neuroscience research bears this out as well. This cannot be other than sustained, challenging, and varied. You gotta push yourself or this stuff will not work. This isn't a talk about the future. This is a talk about right now. So neuroprotect yourself and exercise your brain. Thanks. Thank you. I Felt like I should have run up on the stage after that one. That's great. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brandon Gibb. Dr. Gibb is a um, professor in our psychology department, and he's a child psychologist. In fact, he's one of the leading experts in depression and anxiety in the developing game, in the developing brain. He is uh, often interviewed by the media. Yeah, um, you, you may even see his name in print. Um, many times this happens. And today, he's going to show you how to 
um, how your eyes are really the light that uh, opens up your soul. So, Dr. Gibb. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, and especially since it's so beautiful outside, I appreciate you taking the time to come in here. So they say that eyes are the windows to the soul, and recent findings in neuroscience research have proven this is more true than ever before. What if I said that just by looking at your eyes, I could tell you about your past? What if I said I could tell you your future? And what if I said by playing games on your phone, you may be able to improve your mood, reduce your depression, reduce your anxiety, and this might even be just as effective as traditional therapy? In the next few minutes, I'm going to walk through a lot of this research talking about each of these things. So as you've been walking around today and as you walk through your life, you're um, confronted with a lot of people, right? And you're, there's um, constant information coming into your brain. You choose what to focus on, right? And sometimes you focus on things even when you're not choosing to do it. Your attention's drawn to different things. You probably noticed it this weekend, right? Um, coming back to campus, if you're coming here for um, in the first time in a while, you're seeing old friends, or if you're um, still a student here and you're walking around and, and seeing if you see someone you know. If you're the type of person that tends to pay attention to the people who are looking angry or grumpy and not excited to see you, it's going to affect your mood. You're going to start feeling the exact same way. Instead, if you're the type of person who tends to focus on the positive people around you, then it's going to enhance your mood and you're going to start feeling better. Right? So what you pay attention to can influence your mood. It works the other way just as well. So the way you're feeling influences what you tend to pay attention to. So if you're, feel, if you're walking home late at night through a dark alley, you might feel anxious. And if you're feeling anxious, you're going to be really on the lookout for anything that might jump out from the shadows, right? This makes sense to us in neuroscience because of the way the eye is connected to the brain. So the eye is connected to emotional centers within the brain, like the amygdala. And this forms a, a circuit of emotion regulation where you have these prefrontal areas that will downregulate amygdala activity and also um, help you to um, disengage your attention from one thing or engage your attention in something else. Here's the first thing I'll talk about today. So we've done a lot of studies in our lab where we look at subtle changes in pupil dilation. So if you see something that's emotional, your pupil will dilate slightly. We've shown that kids of depressed moms, so moms who have a history of depression, their pupil will um, dilate specifically to sad faces. Kids of anxious moms, their pupil will dilate specifically to um, angry faces. So your pupil reflects the environment you grew up in as a kid, and it reflects your experiences. So that's exciting enough for us. What we then wanted to do was say, well, can we use this information to predict which kids are going to go on to develop depression in the next couple years? This is what we found. So we looked at... Um, um, the kids who had the highest level of pupil dilation just to sad faces. Five out, of, um, five out of ten of them developed a depressive disorder in the next two years. Compared to kids with the lowest levels of pupil dilation, only one out of ten developed a depressive disorder in the next um, two years. So not only does this reflect your past experience, it can also tell us what's likely to happen to you in the future. Our goal with this is to say, okay, um, we can use this as a marker of risk, and then we can intervene early to prevent this from happening. Here's another interesting thing. The, um, um, if we look at just depressed kids, they tend to look more at, sad fa uh, uh, more at happy faces and less at sad faces. This makes sense to us because if the pupil's indicating how emotionally reactive you are, right, looking at a sad face is going to make you feel even worse, so they're choosing to attend to a happy face as a way to try to make themselves feel better. All right, this sounds like it would be adaptive. The um, interesting thing for us is that adults seem to lose this ability. So in depressed adults in our lab, what we've shown is that um, they have a hard time disengaging their attention from angry faces. They just, once their attention um, lands on an angry face, it gets stuck there, and they can't pull their attention away. The interesting thing about this is that this also predicts their risk of relapsing into a new depressive op episode in the, past, in the next couple years. So among the women who have the um, highest level of attention to angry faces, six out of 10 will develop a new episode of depression in the next two years, compared to two out of 10 um, women who don't get stuck on the angry faces, right? So this is a, a, a threefold increase in risk based just on what you tend to pay attention to. 
Okay, so now that we know this, now that we can predict risk, right, the next logical question is, well, what can you do about it, right? It's only helpful to know risk if you can then do something to help people. What if we could find a way to change what you pay attention to, and what if that would change your mood? People are starting to um, test these types of interventions out. So this is a, um, um, a computer-based intervention to change um, your attention. What you do is you have two different things on a computer screen. One is that bad thing you tend to focus on. The other thing is something um, more positive or at least less negative. These show up on a screen for a little while and then they disappear and it's just a letter or something else appears on the screen. All you have to do is say, is this an E or an F, right? And we do this a bunch of times, right? Did you notice a pattern? The letter always follows the more positive thing. So what we're doing without people even having to, to consciously process this is training them to pull their attention away from negative things and focus more on the positive things. There's preliminary evidence, it's still really early with this, but there's preliminary evidence that this might be a useful way of treating anxiety and depression. Some studies have found that you can reduce depression and anxiety by as much as 50% just by using these computer-based games. I'll give you an example of something we've done on campus. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but some college students tend to drink a lot, right? <laughs> Some of them drink so much that it becomes a problem. So what we did is we had um, students on campus, we had the ones who were the really heavy drinkers and we brought them into the lab. We then showed them a list of words and we said, pick out the words um, that seem most relevant to you when you're drinking, right? And everybody picked whichever of their, um, their favorite alcohol words were. We then put this into our training program. And so we had an alcohol word and a neutral word. We trained them to um, pull their attention away from the alcohol word and focus more on the neutral word. We um, gave them the computer program on a, um, um, on a thumb drive, sent it home with them, asked them to do it twice a week for four weeks. It only took about 10 minutes per time for them to do this, so this isn't a very intensive intervention. At the end of the month, we had reduced their drinking by 30%, right? This is still, again, early days, but it shows that if you, if you can identify uh, um, a basic mechanism, then you can target that mechanism really, really directly and have an influence on behavior and have an influence on mood. Okay, the problem is these things are really, 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 really boring. Um, and people do not like doing them. They certainly won't um, go out and do it on their own, right? But what if we could turn it into a game, right? Wouldn't that be nice? What if we could turn it into a game that you had on your phone so it was always with you, right? People have done this. So this is um, Dr. Tracy Dennis at Hunter College. She's developed a, um, an iPhone app where um, two sprites pop up out of the grass. One looks really angry and critical, the other one's neutral. After they disappear, a little swish, um, swish appears in the grass. All you have to do is trace the pattern with your finger, right? The exact same type of thing. The swish always occurs after the neutral face. Right? So even without you knowing what's going on or you having to focus very much, you're training your attention away from the angry face. You get high scores, they give you like these badges and icons, right? And so it's actually an, um, an engaging game to play and people play it without knowing that they're, they're training their attention, right? They do it without knowing it's good for them, which is excellent. Okay. Here's the interesting thing, um, from pulling back to the neuroscience perspective. There's evidence now that these types of interventions increase activity in the prefrontal areas that I was talking about at the beginning of my talk. So it increases activity in these emotion regulation centers of the brain. We think this is extremely exciting. It shows that you can um, use basic findings in neuroscience, you can translate them into clinically applicable types of strategies, and you can make a real difference. Now what we're hoping to do is to um, make these even better, more engaging, and then transfer them into kids that we know are at risk and start our interventions before they actually develop any of, um, any of these disorders. That's our hope. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very informative talk. Okay, we're going to move to our next speaker, and that is Dr. Stephen Trisman. He is a Binghamton graduate, therefore an alum, 
and uh, he is an adjunct professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and he is director emeritus of the Institute of Neurobiology at the University of Puerto Rico. Dr. Treisman is one of the world's leading experts in alcohol, alcohol withdrawal, alcohol tolerance, and he's going to talk to you a little bit today about a very interesting topic, that is how to quench the thirst that drives addiction. Dr. Treisman. Well, I graduated a long time ago. It was 1967. At that time, we did not have any alcohol problems on the campus. It was Harper College because, of course, alcohol had not yet been invented. <laughs> but it now has become a problem, and I'd like to talk to you about that. So for the next 15 minutes, I would like to make you all honorary neuroscientists. It's enjoyable. And I would also like to share with you my own passion for understanding the physical basis of addiction. So that's what we're going to talk about, the physical basis of addiction. The first slide. W.C. Fields. Yeah, it takes a second. There's usually a delay, and then people laugh. Um, it's funny. It's funny. Um, I don't know why people say quitting drinking is so hard. I've done it a thousand times. Um, what we're going to address is why do you need to do that a thousand times? Now, it's funny, but the reality isn't very funny. Um, uh, a significant number... It's a, it, basically, alcohol use is the third leading cause of hospitalization. That means, if you can imagine how much that taxes our economic system and so on, um, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, and the numbers are increasing. And let's face it, everybody in this audience knows somebody whose lives have been impacted by alcohol abuse. It's, it's just rampant and impossible to avoid. Now, one of the things that's most frustrating for the families of an alcoholic is the fact that the alcoholic will say over and over again, I don't want to hurt you anymore. I'm quitting. And they mean it. And the most frustrating thing for their families is that two days later, they're drinking again. So the question is, why is that? If they really meant it, why don't they stop? And what we're going to talk about is the physical changes in the brain that make it so hard for them to stop, even though they really do want it to stop. They do really want to stop. If you ever visit a um, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, the anguish that you'll see there in the faces of the people trying to quit alcohol is heart-wrenching. Yet, they can't do it. Over and over again, they relapse. And the reason they relapse, as I said, is because the brain is changed by the alcohol they've been drinking, and it's not so easy. It's not a level playing field. It's not as though a non-drinker says, well, I won't have any more drinks. It's not like that. Their brains are different. The good news is that we've made amazing breakthroughs in the last few years in understanding the physical basis, and those breakthroughs are translating, and certainly even more are going to translate into treatment strategies so those people, when they say no more drinking, can actually keep to that promise to themselves and their families. Many of you will recognize this as a rat. It's in a chamber, and you can see an electrode coming into the head of the rat, through the head of the rat, into the brain. For me, this is an incredibly important slide. When I was an undergraduate at Harper College, this figure, and this the paper from which it came, was something that we looked at in our physiological psychology class. It was a long time ago. And it's stayed with me ever since and is always somewhere in my mind, I think, as I work to understand the physical basis of addiction. 
So what you can see is that wire comes down and you see a bar there and the rat can take his little paw and press down on that bar. And when he presses down on that bar, an electrical stimulation occurs that goes into the brain. What these authors discovered, these researchers discovered, was that there was only one tiny portion of the brain that caused the rat to want to press that bar. But once it was in that tiny portion of the brain, there was no way that rat was going to move away from the bar. In fact, it pressed the bar over and over and over. I'll animate this slide for you. Over and over and over. And it would sometimes literally die in place because it ignored all other requirements of living, like water, food. Nothing was more important than that electrode stimulating this, what was called the pleasure center, which we now call the reward pathway. So let's take a look, now that we know a little more than they did then, at what this reward pathway actually looks like. What you can see is two little squares. This is, of course, the brain um, modeled in the human he head. And there's two um, little squares called the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area. And these delineate the two ends of the reward pathway in the brain. This is a little easier to read in that respect. So you can see the little green circle and the little blue circle. Those are the brain centers that are critical for the functioning of the reward pathway. You can also see a cable running between the blue circle and the green circle. That cable represents axons that carry electrical signals from one circle, which is the nucleus accumbens, to the other circle, which is the ventral tegmental area. Forget I ever said that, because it's not critical to understand the names. What is critical to understand is when that cable carries electrical current from the blue circle to the green circle, <clears throat> dopamine is released into the brain. Dopamine is a wonderful neurotransmitter in many ways. It makes us feel good. And that release of dopamine from the activity in the reward pathway is, good, is feeling good. Now, we know that you can do it with the metal electrode, but what's remarkable is that every single known drug of abuse activates the reward pathway. It does exactly the same thing as that metal electrode did. It makes it pretty clear why we like to take drugs of abuse. And just like that rat, it makes it pretty clear why for some people, it's pretty hard to walk away from the bar, literally. <laughs> the bar for the rat, the bar for the person. <laughs> so now what we're going to do is take some of the information that we know of. Now that we've looked, oh sorry, now that we've looked at the um, ventral, that, uh, the reward pathway, and ask what, what insights we can gather from knowing about this reward pathway and knowing that the electrical activity in this reward pathway determines the pleasure that's derived from drugs, we're going to explore some scenarios know, with this knowledge in mind. Scenario one is a non-alcoholic, naive with respect to alcohol, and we record the electrical activity in their reward pathway, and it's pretty quiet. We then give this person, who's been naive with respect to alcohol, a drink. And what happens? The activity in the reward pathway goes crazy. We can measure this with electrophysiology, and we can also measure it with brain imaging. So let's say 100% activity is top-level activity. This person, who's never seen alcohol before, reaches that 100% level with one or two drinks. They're experiencing the buzz that everybody wants to feel when they drink alcohol after one or two drinks. Now let's take um, scenario three. And this is an alcoholic sitting in the same chair, drinking from the same glass. Takes one drink, almost nothing happens in the reward pathway. Doesn't much change. Takes two drinks. Little change, maybe 20%. Three drinks, maybe 30%. 
four drinks, five drinks. Now at five drinks, they're probably up to the same level of activity as the person who was naive attained at one drink. They're feeling pr pretty good. They're feeling the buzz that they're after. Um, their brain activity in general in this um, circuit is, is active. Now let's take one more scenario. This is the scenario of the alcoholic when we take away the drug. So this is the opposite. Instead of handing them the glass with the alcohol, we're taking away that glass with the alcohol. What happens to that individual? Um, first of all, as we all probably are aware, they're going to undergo withdrawal systems. The activity levels, electrical activity in their reward pathway, is very quiet. They're not used to that. They don't like it. It's not comfortable. It's not rewarding. It's not happy. What happens to that, al to that alcoholic at that point? Their entire life becomes focused on finding a drink. They need that drink. They crave that drink. They crave activity in their reward circuit. So while tolerance may be great in terms of being able to outdrink your buddy, it's not so great when circumstances change or when you want to stop drinking. Let me tell you a story because what I'm describing to you withdrawal is really tolerance to the drug. That's why it takes five drinks to get to where the naive person took only one. Let's say at the university we had a freshman who broke the law and was willing to drink and that freshman went to a frat party, very, very anxious to impress the frat brothers, who were very experienced drinkers. So this freshman sits down with them, and they all sit down, and they have a beer. And um, the first beer, as I pointed out to you in scenario two, the first beer, and this freshman, he's got his buzz. <laughs> he's feeling like he's had some alcohol. But the frat brothers, they're not in that scenario, they're in scenario three, and they don't feel too much after that first drink. Then they have the second drink, and their activity, their electoral activity, maybe goes up to 30%. The third drink maybe goes up to 50%. Maybe it takes them six drinks to get up to that 100% activity level where they feel comfortable. So they've had six drinks. This freshman who's trying to keep up with them has had six drinks. The upperclassmen are sitting there, they're feeling pretty happy. The poor freshman is in an ambulance on the way to the hospital with alcohol poisoning. The reason for that is he did not have a tolerant brain and he couldn't handle six drinks. But he, of course he didn't know that when he was trying to keep up. So this knowledge that we have of what's going on in the electrical activity in the reward pathway gives us great power to, number one, understand alcoholism, and number two, potentially develop treatments for alcoholism. What are some of the direct benefits of this knowledge? Number one, I find when I talk to a group of alcoholics or addicts and present to them pictures that show the actual changes in the brain. I was going to try and stuff 30 years of research into the 15 minutes but I, I decided not to. Um, but if I could have, I could have shown you pictures in the brain that literally do show the changes that occur as a function of exposure to the drug over years. When I show these addicts or alcoholics these pictures, they are extraordinarily thankful. Finally, something, somebody is showing them a disease with a physical basis that's different than, hey, you, got, you don't have any willpower. You're just a kind of a weaky kind of person. And um, they don't feel that way anymore. They feel empowered to actually make a change where they felt hopeless to make a change before, simply knowing that there was a physical basis for their situation. Number two, it may lead to successful intervention. If we're going to develop, for example, medications to combat the craving due to the changes in electrical activity in the reward pathway, we at least know what to aim for. We know what kinds of receptors are there. We know what kinds of transmitters are there. 
we have some idea of what we want the molecule of medicine to look like in order to have an effect. Um, I, I might mention that while I'm talking about developing medications for treatment, other things are becoming very effective as well, such as meditation. Interestingly enough, meditation has a tremendous effect on the electrical activity in the reward pathway. So not much of a surprise, but pretty interesting. Number three, maybe this knowledge can help with prevention. How many of you have, I don't know how many of you have kids, but those of you who do, how often do they listen to you? Uh, <laughs> hardly ever from my, from my experience. Uh, so if you say to this child, um, you really better not drink. It could have serious consequences. Don't waste your time. I mean, <laughs> very few kids don't partake because of that advice. However, if you show them this is a picture of the brain of somebody who has been drinking, if you start down this path and you happen to be susceptible to alcohol addiction, that's what your brain is going to look like in a little while. It has a much greater impact than just saying, it's really bad for you. And so it might help with intervention. And the, um, this is really prevention, rather, in education. And I might point out that my wife constantly tells me that I don't focus enough on education in terms of stopping diseases like um, alcoholism. And I think the latest recommendation of the Institute of Pediatrics was that every parent should be sitting down with their nine-year-old and talking to them about alcohol. Nine years old. I don't think that's done very often. That's their recommendation. A few days ago, we had dinner with some friends, and those friends asked me what I was going to talk about. I told them, and they suddenly opened up and started sharing about the fact that they had an alcoholic daughter. And their daughter was causing them more anguish than most of you can imagine. That dinner was filled with tears. It was filled with hopelessness. It was not great dinner conversation. On the other hand, I was able to tell them, we're making progress. We are seeing advances. Your daughter may be able to overcome this. Make clear their daughter wanted to overcome it. An alcoholic isn't just saying, hey, I want to quit, and not meaning it. And I think that's what's so hard for people to understand. It just seems like, give me a break. If you really want to quit, you would just quit. Their brain is different. It's not easy for them to quit. So my hope is that with our knowledge of the physical basis of addiction, we'll be able to develop treatments. We'll be able to do better preventive treatment. Conversations like I just described will become obsolete. That's my hope, and that's also um, what I believe will be the case. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, now it's going to be my pleasure to introduce our fourth speaker, Dr. Sarah Laszlo. Dr. Sarah Laszlo is an assistant professor in two areas, psychology and linguistics. She is also the director of the Brain and Machine Lab. She is a recent recipient of uh, a coveted five-year National Science Foundation Award for early career uh, development. And she's going to talk to you about the world of brain printing. Now, she, she is one of these leading edge researchers in brain printing. And this is something that we used to think of in terms of science fiction, but it is a concept now that uh, really is coming to its uh, forefront in the area of neuroscience. Now, I need to tell you something. The very beginning of her talk is going to have some intense um, uh, flashing, rapid flashing lights. If any of you are sensitive to rapid flashing lights, uh, you really should exit the theater 
now, and I'm serious about this. It's going to be a very interesting talk, but it will contain some intense, rapid flashes at the very beginning. So, okay, Dr. Lazo. Hi, everyone. Thank you to my students who came to see me talk on a Saturday when they didn't even have to. My little heart is just breaking. All right, I'm about to take control of your brain. Are you ready? This is my graduate student, Maria Ruiz Blondet. And this is about one second of her brain activity. And you didn't know it, but in the video I was just showing you, the screen changed color every time there was a peak or a valley in Maria's brain activity. The idea of a video like this is to stimulate your brain in sync with the brain activity of someone else and, and that stimulation cause your brain activity to start to resemble the brain activity of another person. When we do this in the laboratory, when we show people videos like this in the laboratory, there's a very distinct change in ongoing brain activity that occurs shortly after we start stimulating someone like this. Why would we want to do this? Why would we want to try to make someone's brain activity more like someone else's? Well, what if somebody, like my research assistant, Aaron Baker, wanted to impersonate the brain activity of someone else? What if he wanted to sneakily sneak by and have his brain activity fool someone into thinking that he was Maria? Why would anyone want to do that? Why would anybody want their brain activity to look like the brain activity of someone else? That's what I'm going to tell you today. It starts with this woman. This is Ursula van der Leyen. She's a German Minister of Defense. In 2014, a hacker member of the Chaos Computer Club stole Ursula van der Leyen's fingerprint simply by taking a high-resolution photograph of her hands without her knowledge at a press conference. Having done this, he made the high-resolution scan of her fingerprints available online. And now every system in the entire German defense network that was secured with van der Leyen's fingerprint is compromised, and not only compromised, but compromised forever. That's because van der Leyen cannot grow a new finger. He stole her fingerprint. Nothing secured with her fingerprint is safe anymore. Perhaps even more alarming, on September 23rd of this year, so just a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times reported that Chinese cyber espionage agents had stolen the fingerprints of 5.6 million American workers. Just like van der Leyen's fingerprints, any system that was secured with those fingerprints is now compromised. The, nu the nuclear launch codes, the army bases, and all of our tax information sitting on the IRS servers is now compromised, and not just compromised, but compromised forever. Because none of those people can grow their finger fingers back again. They can't grow new fingers. Those are done for. What these anecdotes, I hope, shows you is that for the most secure information these days, things we really don't want hackers to get their hands on, a biometric credential like a fingerprint is simply not secure enough. And that's why my lab has developed the BrainPrint protocol, the next generation of brain biometrics. This is something literally out of a science fiction movie. And when I say literally, I mean literally. I mean the movie X-Men 2. If any of you have seen the movie X-Men 2, you know that in X-Men 2, Professor X, played by Patrick Stewart here, has a system called the Cerebro system that helps him to amplify his telepathy. That's what that funny hat is that he's wearing. The Cerebro system is keyed to Professor X's brain activity. 
So in the film, when the villain, Mystique, tries to illicitly use the Cerebro system, it notices that her brain activity is not the brain activity of Professor X, and it painfully ejects her from the system. Our brain print system works the same way, without the pain. It doesn't hurt anybody. Let's say this is Professor X's brain print. This is a real brain print, but it doesn't belong to Professor X because he's fictional, but the brain print is real. If Professor X wants to get into a system that's secured by the brain print, he provides his brain activity a second time, and if his brain activity the second time matches his brain print provided the first time, the system recognizes him and lets him in. But if someone like Mystique tries to sneak into the system and provide her brain activity to the brain print system, it recognizes that that brain activity does not match Professor X's, and it doesn't give her access. My, this sounds crazy, right? It's from a science fiction movie. You're actually, you, 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 I want you to believe that we can actually do this. We can actually do this. My laboratory is the first laboratory worldwide to show that in a pool of 30 people, we can identify someone on the basis of their brain activity 100% of the time. That's right, I said 100%. You can't get higher than 100%. That's as good as it gets. It's good that we can do this. It's good that we can identify people from, from their brain activity. Because there's a lot of characteristics of brain prints that we think make them superior to something like fingerprints. <clears throat> so for example, if you've seen the Quentin Tarantino alias episode, which is the best alias episode, hands down, you know that if you want to get into a safe that's secured by a fingerprint biometric, one really easy way to do it is to just cut off the finger of someone who can get into the safe. You cut off his finger, you take the finger, you walk over to the safe, you put the finger up against the biometric plate, and in you go and you steal whatever you want. You can't do that with brain prints. If you take somebody's brain out of their head, it stops working. If you chop somebody's head off, it stops working. So you can't do that. Well, that didn't actually work for Quentin T Tarantino either in the Alias episode. So what's the next thing you might want to do if you want to try to break into a safe that's secured by a fingerprint? Well, you have a big gun like Quentin Tarantino has. You could put it to somebody's head and say, hey, put your fingerprint on the biometric plate or I'm going to blow your brains out. We don't think this would work for, to break into a brain print system either. And the reason for that is that it's very well known that when a person is placed under stress, like they would be placed under certainly if someone was, someone was threatening to shoot them, when a person is placed under stress, their brain activity changes dramatically. It changes so much that sometimes you can see it with the naked eye in the, in the brain recordings. You don't even need fast, fancy software or fancy computer systems to pull it out. So we think that if somebody threatened a brain print user to try to force them to give access to the brain print system, it wouldn't work because their brain activity would change too much. A final advantage that brain prints have over fingerprints. As I alluded to when I was talking about van der Leyen and the Chinese espionage, I said that those fingerprints are compromised forever because people can't grow new fingerprints. But brain prints don't share that characteristic. So for example, Professor X's brain print that I showed you earlier happens to be brain activity that was recorded while the person, not Professor X, was looking at pictures of black and white foods. If, in the unlikely event that somebody was able to steal Professor X's brain print, this version could be canceled and a new one could be recorded, perhaps in response to something like celebrity faces, which is another type of simulation that we use in my lab. So, Brain prints seem like they have a lot of features to them that make them more secure than fingerprints. There's some reasons to think that, this, that using brain prints to secure our most classified information could be more, more surefire than using a fingerprint. But there's still one way. There's still one way that a person might be able to break the brain print system and get into a brain print protected system. And that's by impersonation. So what if, now back to the beginning of the talk, my research assistant Aaron wants to break into a brain print system that's been keyed to my, my graduate student Maria's brain activity. Could he do it? This is what we try to find out. We showed Aaron, we trained Aaron by showing him 
a video that was exactly like the one, actually it was the same one that you saw at the beginning of the talk, but you had to watch it for 30 seconds and Aaron had to watch it for 12 hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing that Aaron is a super guy. I wish he could be here today, actually, he couldn't. Um, but he's a super guy and, and for science, and because he likes learning about the brain and because he's a super guy, he endured watching this video for 12 hours. And this is the big test. This is the big test because if somebody can break into a brain print system just by watching a stupid video for 12 hours, then all the stuff I said before about brain prints being really secure probably doesn't really amount to much. So what did we find? Just to orient you, we can look at, for example, how similar Maria's brain activity is the second time she submits a brain print to how to the first time she tries to submit a brain print. So there's three bars on this graph, and the Maria Maria bar is the biggest. <laughs> so Maria to Maria is the most similar. That's good. If that weren't true, this whole setup wouldn't be working very well. If we compare Aaron's brain activity to Maria's at the start of training, those two things are much less similar to each other. That's the smallest bar of the three. But if we compare Aaron's brain activity to Maria's brain activity at the end of training, what you can see is that it's become more similar to Maria's brain activity. The training worked. Just by watching this video for 12 hours, Aaron was able to make his brain activity more like Maria's. But it's important to point out that even though the training worked, and that's kind of amazing, we made some guy's brain work more like someone else's brain just by flashing lights at him. That's, that's pretty awesome. But it's important to point out that even though Aaron's brain activity got more like Maria's, it wasn't good enough to fool the brain print algorithm. Maria's brain activity is still more similar to Maria's than Aaron's is. So this is pretty great. We can train someone's brain, but we can't train it well enough to beat the brain print algorithm. But now that we've opened this can of worms, now that we know that we can train Aaron's brain to behave a little bit more like Maria's, now there's some interesting possibilities here. So for example, what if, at least at the start of training, Maria loves sushi, but Aaron hates it? What if we then show him 12 hours of Maria's sushi-loving brain activity and try to stimulate his brain in a sushi-loving pattern? Will that be enough to make him start to like sushi? Will we finally be able to get Aaron to go with us to a sushi restaurant? Wouldn't that be great? I'm a vegan, so I can say this. Wouldn't that be great if you got your vegan friends to be able to go to a meat restaurant with you? That would be great. More seriously, though, what if we could use a system like some technology like this for more serious purposes? What if we could take someone that's deathly afraid of spiders and make them less afraid of spiders by training their brain to behave like the brain of someone that isn't afraid of spiders? What if we could take the brain of someone that has PTSD, say, from a combat situation that suffers every time they hear a car backfire, and train their brain to respond to a car backfire the way some person who has never been in combat does and doesn't get upset when they hear a car firing? Even raising the stakes higher, what if we could take poor Jennifer Aniston who's forced to see Brad Pitt's face plastered all over the known universe, even after their terrible breakup, and heal her heart so that when she sees Brad Pitt's face, she doesn't have to be sad anymore. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could do that? We don't know if we're gonna be able to do that. We've only just started this research. So if you wanna find out, you're gonna have to stay tuned and come back to Homecoming next year. Thank you. Okay, um, so let's get started, and uh, we'll ask a few simple, straightforward questions that some of you have emailed. Uh, Steve, does I, the brain... I don't... Oh, yes, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Good. Does the brain ever return to normal after addiction and recovery? What a good question. Whoever asked that, you really did become a neuroscientist. Um, the fact is that is one of the most amazing questions because, in fact... Even after somebody is abstinent for years, their 
um, propensity to go back to drinking is way higher than somebody who had never been addicted. Those are the changes in the brain that we don't know how they happen. How do you encode something that, that lasts for 15 years? It would be a wonderful answer to have. We're working on it, but no, nobody knows the answer. Okay. Chris, can I buy neurotrophins on Amazon? <laughs> Not Ser yet. <laughs> seriously, what games, what puzzles, any suggestions? What, what, what might be the most beneficial? And are there things, and I'm going to combine this with another question from the audience. Yeah. Are there things that people do in other countries that might be um, useful to us? You know, different types of games or activities. You know, we're, we're, we're still trying to understand, you know, what are the optimal things we can do. Uh, you know, the people, I'm, this is no plug, I swear, for <laughs> something like Lumosity, but, but they do have the idea that if you have a complex task and you perform it and you do it often enough and you change the kinds of tasks you do, then that can be useful. Um, but I would say that if you like doing crossword puzzles, it's going to help with your, your verbal fluency, and that means that something is helping you to communicate more readily and bring words about more readily. Um, you know, doing the Sudoku's or, or uh, learning a new instrument is fantastic. Like, I would, I would tell anybody to give that a try because, boy, that's a really new thing for a lot of people, and it engages a lot of brain. Um, in terms of other places around the world, uh, you know, I think some of them have, have, have figured out the diet thing, but I, but I think it's such a new field that we're not entirely sure exactly what we can be doing when it comes to exercising your brain, other than the things I've mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah, get out your crystal bowl and tell us five years from now, uh, what would you expect to be routine? What do you think we're going to be doing with brain printing? Yeah, it's a good question. I get asked this a lot. Um, it, it's hard because in order to get it to work as well as it does now, you might not be surprised to know we have to use very expensive equipment. So the system that does this is probably $75,000, $80,000, which of course you are not going to have on your phone like you do in your iPhone. So one of the things that we're really working on is trying to find ways to get the technology that will do this to be cheaper, to be smaller, to be wireless, to fit in your pocket instead of in a small room. Um, but even then, in the next five years, we mostly see the applications for something like this being military. Um, and my, 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 my peace-loving friends all scorn me for working on things with military applications. Um, but but we, see it, we see it mostly as, you know, you're at the Pentagon and you need to go into the Situation Room and it's just really important to be sure that you're the person that you're saying you are, that it's worth it to spend the fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. So that's, that's, in reality, that's probably, at least in the next five years, as, as far as I imagine this would go. Thank you. Uh, Brandon, um, I'm actually going to give you two questions, so I'm going to ask them one at a time, and then I'm going to move on to the next one. So uh, with the brain training app to prevent uh, depression, um, is, does, it, does it work as well if the user is aware that that's what that app is doing for them, or does it really change the applicability of the app? So um, again, this is really early days on a lot of this stuff, um, but we think it doesn't matter. You can, I think that um, a friend of ours has, um, Nader Amir um, out in San Diego, has done studies where he randomizes people to either tell them what to expect or not tell them. And it, it just doesn't matter. Um, the, the fact is that you just get practice you know, pulling your attention away. The second question is, is there an Android app for attention training or does it? I do not know. <laughs> I have an iPhone. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I, think, um, I think it exists. It's called, so this one, so this one, I'm not putting in a plug other than I think it's the coolest thing I've seen, right? So it's called Personal Zen. And you can look on the, um, the Android store. I know it's, um, it's an iPhone app. It's free. And it's, um, it's just one example of a way that you can um, translate basic um, neuroscience into... Um, into a game that might be useful for people. Okay, 
And um, with the study of the pupil dilation, um, are we able to predict yet whether kids will develop or have spectrum disorders such as autism, et cetera? Not that I know, no. no. And I think that um, okay. um, people who look, so I have a, a former student who does, um, looks at attention in autistic kids. And what she really focuses on is um, more joint attention. You know, so when you're talking to someone, are you, are you making eye contact? If they're, if they're doing something, are you attending to the same thing or do you get distracted? So we still think attention's important. It's just a slightly different um, form of attention. Okay. And Sarah, are you a sci-fi nut? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what else do you see out there? I mean, what else do I see in the sci-fi world that's real? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's real. Um, yeah, or it could be real soon. Um, you know, oh, this is interesting. I wish someone had asked me this like an hour ago, so I could have been <laughs> thinking about it for the whole last hour. Um, so I, I teach, my, one of my teaching interests is artificial intelligence, and so I teach an artificial intelligence class, and I think that... Um, so, I, and because of this, and because I am a sci-fi nut, I watch and read and consume a lot of um, artificial intelligence science fiction. And I think it's, it's, it's a topic that we come back to again and again in my class. It's, it's really interesting that when you look at media portrayals of artificial intelligence, some of the things that like an artificial intelligence on a TV show can do are so far beyond what real artificial intelligence can do, but some of the things that real artificial intelligence can do is actually super far beyond what they might be portrayed as being able to do on a TV show. So um, I, I guess for me, you know, in the next five or 10 years, one of the things that I'm most excited about is seeing the artificial intelligence sort of come alive um, and become, become more and more a part of our, of our daily lives. For me, that's what's really exciting. Okay, thank you. Chris, can you measure neurotrophins with a simple test? And how expensive? So uh, it's, it actually is quite tricky. The, the molecule itself is, is a little bit hard to get to in the brain itself, and, and it doesn't really circulate well and correlate well in blood. The way that they will do it in some of these, these big studies that I was talking about is through basically a spinal tab. And so it's not easy and it's not uh, pleasant either. So we're, we're trying to get better at this actually, okay. but uh, at, the, at, the, at this point, we're still a little bit away from that. Do you think it would be worthwhile to be able to measure neurotrophins? Do you think that could lead to some therapeutic breakthroughs? You know, it's interesting. Neurotrophins are, are actually thought to be important for affective states as well. And, uh, and it's well known that antidepressants may be working not to, to increase too much neurotrophins, but maybe correct for low neurotrophins. So is it a biomarker for a disease state or an affective problem like depression? Maybe, but you know we need them to function all the time, so it may not be the, the most specific. We're still in the search for good biomarkers for disease, and that I think is something that I see work in, you know, in the future that we continue to work towards. Okay, thank you. Steve, latest medication. What, what's out there? We know naloxone with heroin, what's a, and it doesn't really cure the heroin ad addicts, but what's the latest medication with, for alcohol treatment? Uh, is there something that's effective? Naltrexone is used for alcoholism as well. It's, okay. It is, you're right, it's a, an opiate blocker. But there are opiate receptors that feed into the reward pathway that I was talking about. But it's not very effective. People are now taking um, naltrexone in one month doses. So they only need to do it one month. Um, one of the problems with naltrexone is it, it dulls your pleasure levels independent of the drug because yeah. it's blocking that reward pathway. So some people don't like to take it. There's another drug called a compressate that's been more widely used in um, Europe. Again, I, I mean, the answer is there are no great pharmacological treatments. I think there's a lot of hope in things like meditation, um, non-pharmacological at all. And what's really interesting about these medications is that they're very effective for a small proportion of the people. It's not as though they're mildly effective for everybody. So we'd really love to know what it is about that small set that makes it so effective for them and not the others when 
on the surface, they seem to be suffering exactly the same disease. Yeah, I've got one more question for you. Um, well, what, what was it that made you devote your life to studying alcoholism? Was it being a thing? No. Would, <laughs> what, what, what was the original driving okay. force that what got you interested in this? So field? there's two reasons. One is very personal, and that is that my cousin died of a drug overdose when I was a kid, and I didn't even know he was an addict. That's, that's how secret it was, because I was friends with him. Um, that <coughs> stayed with me. My wife's cousin died of alcoholism. Um, but then if I'm 100% honest, but with a small group of friends like this, I can be, the fact is that um, I started studying alcohol because I was interested in epilepsy, and I was looking for anything that would block epileptic-type electrical activity in the brain that led to seizures. And one of the things <coughs> that had a tremendous effect was alcohol. The effect was actually in the wrong direction. It elicited epilepsy-type activity, but it's one of those serendipities of doing science that I was really looking for something completely different. I applied for my grant from the National Institute of Alcoholism. They gave it to me. I suddenly was hanging around with alcohol people, and um, it became a driving force. I, I think it's the most interesting thing to study in the sense that there's no aspect of human personality and behavior that you can't study by studying addiction. You know, craving, all of these things, all of these natural elements of human behavior are elements of addiction. Thank you. Chris, what's the evidence that luminosity works? There is not a ton of evidence that it works. Um, they, they will have data, and, the, and people are starting to study this. I mean, this is the new part <laughs> about neuroprotection, is corporate America has sort of gotten a hold of this idea that you could market this, sell it as real neuroscience, and they use it. I mean, I think I heard it, uh, you probably have heard it before the commercial. I think I heard it in the last two days. Um, but there is some evidence in the laboratory in better controlled environments that you can see improvements on cognition. What we don't have are things like brain scans for a lot of those studies right now. Thank you. And Brandon, um, I have quite a lengthy question. I'm going to try to make it a bit shorter. It is from someone who does work with kids. And so what they want to know is if you, if you when, when children are depressed and have anxiety, that working with their phones actually seems to be helpful to them, so working games or, or things like that. So um, then they can cope. And sometimes they can't cope without their phones even. So what they really want to know is if you can help them with some type of app, what prevents them then from becoming internet addicts or uh, gaming addicts? I think the, um, you know, the, the overriding part of the talk and in, in the, the way we think about our research is that you need balance. You know? And so with the attention, the, the reason it's a problem is because your attention gets stuck somewhere. You can't, you can't you know, um, look around the room and take in everything because you're so stuck. And I would say the same thing about the apps. What people are doing, though, is um, testing these things and saying, um, if you do this um, program as prescribed, then does it affect how you're, you know, the other things you're doing in your life? So are you more likely to go out? Are you more likely to socialize? And I, I think that's the, um, one, that's the research we need to do, and two, that's the message we need to give people, that this is you know, one more thing that you want to try in moderation um, um, as part of your day. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I would like to uh, thank all of our speakers today. I think this has been really enlightening, um, really fantastic. And They'll be hanging around. If any of you have further questions and want to contact them, um, they'll be here for near the front. Thank you very much. <laughs>